Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I have a very interesting stream with someone whose work I found uh, well worth a read for a long time, so I'm very excited to have this talk. Mary Harrington, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I've uh, got a lot of different places I want to go with you, but I try to start the same way for people who might not be familiar with your work. Uh, how did you get started writing about what you're doing now? And what's what's kind of the focus of what you talk about? Um, I, I fell into writing completely by accident, um, having given up working altogether to be a stay at home mum. I mean, it was, you know, it's, it's a nice life being a stay at home mum, but there's also a lot going on politically. And it's not like your brain shuts down just because you've got kids to look after. Um, so I was kind of glued to my phone watching the Brexit campaign and the Twitter account, which is now my now my main Twitter account, uh, Move in Circles, actually originated um, as an anonymous account, which I set up purely for the purpose of taking the mickey out of the Stronger In campaign, the Remain campaign, just because their, their positions seemed so ludicrous and so elitist and so just worthy of satire. Uh, but I, I realized quite quickly that well, A, Brexit wasn't the only thing I wanted to tweet about. And B, um, it's almost it was almost impossible to satirize them because they were just they were they, whatever it was that I came up with, not not only were the people on my side who just didn't read it as satire, <laughs> but they well, the, but the stuff that the Remain campaign themselves came up with was actually more comical than anything I could think of. Um so I just kind of I ended up tweeting more seriously and then f fell back into blogging, which I've done on and off since forever. Um and unheard wrote to me and said, "Did I want to? Did I want to pitch to them?" And I think, I think I, I published with them first in 2019, and I've written for them pretty much every week since. So it's completely accidental. I mean, I, I became a writer sort of by mistake at the age of 40, um, and since then the world has just gone crazy, and I've written about it. I think is the, is the shortest answer. Well, I appreciate your origin story as an anonymous shit poster. That's that's uh, <laughs> quite admirable. Um, so uh, the the blog, you write about a whole uh, lot of different stuff when it comes to kind of modern life and its intersection with with technology and, and, and all the different things that are happening right now, like you said, as the world goes crazy. But I wanted to start off with, you know, kind of the name of your sub stack, which is the reactionary feminist. Now, obviously, you know, this is a term that's going to have a lot of people, you know, confused. What what's going on? What's going on with this mixture here? Most people hear feminism can't have anything to do with re being a reactionary. What what does a reactionary mean to you? What does a feminist mean to you? How do these things interact? Well, um, I I started out calling myself a post liberal feminist, and then um, I got a DM slide from a guy who's now a great friend of mine. Um, resulted in like a three month argument about whether or not post liberal was even a thing, and if so, what did it mean? Um, at the end, and his his stance. Um, which I ended up conceding in the end was that post liberal is essentially that post liberals are just reactionaries who don't inhale. So um, in the end, I in the end I came round to his way of thinking, and um, by by way of by way of conceding the point, I just changed my Twitter bio to reactionary feminist from post liberal feminist, just to see how long it would take him to notice. So again, I mean, it's another very online story. Um, but that was that was how I came up with that was how that was the origin of reactionary feminist. I just thought it sounded cool and a bit confusing. And then First Things, um, the Catholic conservative American magazine wrote to me to say, this is a, this is an interesting idea, being a reactionary feminist. Please, can you explain what it means? So I thought, crap, I better figure out what it means. So, so they commissioned me. They commissioned me to come up with an explanation for something which I'd kind of memed into existence. Um, and you know, in the course of in the course of writing that, I did figure out what it meant. I mean, very briefly. It just it's it, it's everything which falls out of trying to answer the question: Is it possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress? Because um, I, I I very much lost my faith in progress theology relatively early compared to um, some of the more some of the more recently black pill on that. Um, I think I probably I, pro I probably became a progress atheist back in 2008 with a big crash, but with a bunch of other personal things as well. Um, and since then, I've been trying to answer the question, what, is it possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress? Um, and there's, I mean, the short answer is not really, but, the, but there's a very much longer answer to that, which I've just finished writing a book about, Feminism Against Progress. Um, and yeah, I think re reactionary feminist just feels feels like a more a more entertaining place to, to make that argument from than, than post-liberal feminist, which is just a bit wet, let's face it. So losing faith in progress, uh, you know, a lot of we, a lot of people throw around the phrase reactionary, but very few people, I think, take the time to think about what the implications there are. 
a lot of people, you know, th there's no way they can think about life without thinking about progress as inevitable, good, the goal. W when you say against progress, how do you mean that? And, you know, how can people, how can people live lives that are fulfilling if it's not about progress? Sure. Um, well, I, I, th I suppose the problem I have with the idea of progress as such is that if you're going to talk about things getting better in some sort of endless onward upward trajectory, you have to define your terms, right? Like Steven Pinker, for example, is very keen on the idea that human humanity is progressing. But as far as he's concerned, economic inequality, for example, is irrelevant to progress. I mean, he has he has the metrics that he likes, but he doesn't consider that one to be a meaningful metric. And if you ask somebody else, they might take a different view, right? Um, but the point is that if you're going to if, if you're going to say things are things are better now than they used to be, um, you have to define your terms, which means you've already begged the question, which is to say you've you've uh, you've assumed the truth of what you set out to prove. Um, so it's it's kind of it's kind of a self fulfilling thing. Um, and in, in my view, it's I mean it's it's self evidently not the case that things don't change. Or and I certainly and nor do I take the view really that things are getting worse. I think that just inverts the same sort of teleological uh, perspective that just to say, you know, things used to be great and now they're all going to shit. Well, they probably are in some ways, but in other ways they might be getting better. Who's to say? I mean, but yeah, I mean, my, my basic position is just that in aggregate, you know, on whatever, you know, on some metrics, things are better than they used to be. On other, on other metrics, things are worse. But I, I, I struggle to see. I, it's not obvious to me that the sum total of human felicity is any greater now than it was, say, 3000 years ago. I just I just I don't see how that's provable or really a meaningful thing to try and assert. Um, so. The people, a lot of people, nonetheless, a lot of people believe in progress. Um, but, but, but the, you know, the basis, and and you know, much more, much more erudite people than me have written about this. Um, so none of this is a particularly original point. Um, but it's just a sort of basic premise of my trying to make sense of what women's interests are now. That the idea of progress is a belief, not a, is this the whole structure of you know progress theology is a belief and not a fact. And given this. Um, you know what, what? What exactly are we talking about when we're talking about the story of the story of women, for example, um, as a as evidence of progress? Because I mean, a lot of the things that people point to when they say, "Oh, you know, things are better than they used to be," you know, one of the first things people will reach for are, "Well, women have the vote now, and they never used to." Um, or you know, any any you can point at you can point at a number of other you know subgroup X is more liberated on on metric Y than they used to be. Um, and my the 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 argument that I found my the, the conclusion I found myself coming to when I started going down this rabbit hole was that I mean, yes yes these things are true but you need but you need to look at them a little bit more historically and you need to look at them materially and you need to look at them in terms of the material conditions that produce them um, which is which is really what brought me to to thinking about feminism in the context of technology and. Um, and really about the whole the whole notion of progress in the context of technology, and I've I've sort of come reluctantly, to be honest, to the conclusion that feminism is not so much evidence of progress in some abstract sense as an effect of the industrial revolution. In well, in this, oh, sorry, continue. No, 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 please. please. <laughs> I, I mean, I can go on about this in, indefinitely. So, so now is probably a good point to break. <laughs> no, I, I was just saying that you know this is um, has a lot of echoes of of Thomas Carlyle in in Chartism, right? He's talking mm -hmm. about you know the the need the obsession with quantification of of progress kind of creates this this dismal attempt to try to put the 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 quality of life of people into some kind of box into some kind of spreadsheet. And the constant pursuit of that goal really completely turns people into something they're not. They, they're not this. They're not this widget. They're not this. Uh, this uh, numerical value that you can assess in mass. And when you apply it to different situations, like maybe female liberation, you could probably point to many different statistical metrics, saying, "Okay, well, this is." a positive this thing over here but like you said you're picking and choosing then what kind of data at the end of the day there has to be something that determines what human well-being is and if you're not having the discussion about what that is then you're just picking and choosing random data points and hoping that that aligns into a narrative called progress absolutely absolutely and i think it's also you know specifically specifically in the context of women and in the context of in the context of especially of becoming and being a mother 
um, which is which is ultimately what a lot of what a lot of the women's movement is, has always been about. It's been about women's women's bodies and women's specific reproductive role, and our, you know how we how or if we form families with men and what happens next, and how all of that fits into the wider matrix of um, the social order. Um, I mean, one of the the sort of starting point for my argument is that um, it was the the industrial era just completely completely blew the previous way of the. I mean, it it radically reorganized family life. It didn't just it didn't just change the way people. The, it didn't just change the stuff that people bought, um, because it changed how people worked. Um, it changed the way families worked inevitably, um, and paradoxically, I mean, the the story that we hear about. The, about the, this whole period is that women have become steadily more liberated. But if you if you look at it in a slightly more fine grained way, you could also argue that women actually lost economic agency, and to and in in some subtle ways political agency at the beginning of the industrial era, um, because they were no longer they were no longer co producers in a, in agrarian productive households, which is you know the your average kind of yeoman farmer. Um, the both both adults worked, or at least every every everyone in the extended family who was capable of working worked and it was you know and, and the fact that it was divided into men's work and women's work in an, in an agrarian or artisan context is neither here nor there the fact is everybody everybody was pulling their weight um, and then what happens with the industrial era is that work shifts out of the home um, the example i've used before is textile making which has always been something that women have done and there are lots of very practical reasons for that you know you can hang a loom off the floor so that you know your toddler's not going to destroy it or kill it or kill themselves in it you know it's social work um you can do it it's easily you can put it down if you're interrupted by something else yeah, yeah, yeah. there are all sorts of reasons why textile making has all, almost always been a female occupation um and then when the industrial era comes along the spinning jenny and all of these machines centralized textile making in locations outside the home and so all of a sudden all of these women who previously combined it with a billion and one other things they were doing in, in within a productive household organized as a central economic unit of social life um, were no longer able to do that and suddenly they've got to you know do i do i drug my baby with opium and leave them for 12 hours a day so i can go and work shifts in a factory or do i or can i afford to, to stay at home and look after my i mean what do you do it's a whole new set of problems and out of this falls out out of this falls an entire new order and an entire new set of political arguments. Um, and and the, the one thing that's really striking at the beginning of the industrial era is just how, my, just how preoccupied everybody was with the questions of men and women and what men's roles and women's roles were. And, and uh, even, even really questions of, yeah, you know, what, and, you know what, what, were, what was everybody's proper role? Because nobody knew anymore. It, was all, it had all just been completely blown out of the water. Um, and the, just to, to fast, I mean, I can I could bore you about this forever. But <laughs> if we zoom right right to the other end of the telescope, um, I the other the, the the end of this story is the end of the industrial era, which I situate in approximately the nineteen sixties. I date the beginning of the cyborg era from the nineteen sixties with with two tech transitions, which were as significant as the arrival of. Um, fossil fuels and industrialization, which is to say the contraceptive revolution, which is really the first tech, the first transhumanist technology, and also the digital revolution, which is the other transhumanist technology. And so I've I've made the argument, and really I'm I'm, I'm happy to stand by it that you know transhumanism isn't a, isn't a weird, distant, strange thing that is being cooked up in Silicon Valley and might be coming down the line if we don't watch out. We have been living in the transhumanist era for well over fifty years. You know this is this is all of our lives. This is just this. This is our reality now, you know. And I think there are, you know, how, how we pass that um, is it is all to play for, um, you know. But but the the nature of that, as the technologies mature and as the culture um, adapts, and as as the as the econ the transhumanist economies become more obvious, and the old and the industrial era really starts to fade into the rearview mirror. Um, I, I think that's becoming much more clear, and the and the the downstream impacts of that are becoming much more widespread. So once we kind of fundamentally arrest a, a core biological function, like gain complete dominion over that, like a natural rhythm of life, you think that's kind of when we begin the cyborg era? Right. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the, there's a, the critical conceptual shift there is, I mean, if you think about medicine historically, its objective is a restorative one. You know, it has a clear picture of what normal, healthy human organism looks like. I mean, I suppose archetypically, you could think of that Michelangelo picture 
of, of the man, the, the man illustrated geometrically inside, inside, you know, you probably know the image I mean. Mm -hmm. um, every, everybody knows what a healthy, well-developed adult man and woman look like. Um, I mean, a toddler, a toddler can tell what an abnormal, abnormally shaped human body can look like just from from having picked up a gestalt understanding of what normal looks like and they'll point them out on the street and embarrass you um you know people people understand people have a have a solid intuitive grasp of what what human normal looks like um but but what what the but but the critical conceptual shift is that the beginning of the transhumanist era we we date from the point where the, where normal in in medical terms becomes the problem that you want to solve so you know the the pill, and then later on abortion, are not curing something which was wrong with a person, like if I had a cold or um, or, or smallpox or something. They're not they're not curing an illness. They're curing not they're curing healthy fertility, and that's a it's a radical inversion of what medicine all of, all all of medical science has aimed to do up to that point, and it and it catapults it catapults us into a new paradigm where effectively we've said we we can set normal to one side and we've we've claimed the right to remodel ourselves as we see fit so to subordinate all of normal to human to the human will and and we're turning we're turning that power and we're turning that sort of faustian energy inwards to the human body and i mean you know we can point to a number of phenomena downstream of that um so I'm, it would, but 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 that's really the point of origin of that the first transhumanist mass transhumanist technology so you, you brought up the phrase Faustian there, and that's where my brain was going as you were kind of uh, describing the, the process you're talking about there. I'm interested, do you think that this form of kind of biological dominion, do you think that that's uh, particular to a culture? Do you think that's particular to a mindset? Do you think that's a human condition? Are we inevitably forced to kind of attempt to, to, to augment are our natural biological functions in this way or or do you think there's a a particular type of society uh, or attitude that brings that about it's hard to say um I, at least I, I, or rather i should say i'm not sure i'm well read enough to be able to pronounce confidently on that i'm trying to trying to remember who the writer is who talks about it might be leo strauss um who writes about the difference between the way the ancient greeks talk, thought about technology and the way the moderns thought about technology yeah i think it's it might be in in when where strauss writes about machiavelli and he talks about he talks about the the, the and the for the ancient greeks they trying to trying to remember the exact the exact way he frames the paradigm shift um But the, I, I think the the presumption of being entitled to 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 use a technology for mastery just wasn't there. Among, he argues it just wasn't there among the ancients for for you know reasons which I, I don't think I'm sufficiently well read to kind of pronounce on. But no, there's something uniquely modern about it. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking uh, Spanglerian uh, kind of the different. He Oswald Spangler spoke a lot about. Kind of the, and then in the Faustian man and his need to constantly expand is is a particular function of kind of the the Western obsession with with progress and I just I just wonder I would just as you were talking about that I was wondering if other civilizations would have naturally arrived because I think what's happening now is whether you believe it's a human uh, trait or whether you think it's particularly cultural I think it's obviously now spread across right it's spilled yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. it's containment at this mm -hmm. point and it's a it's we've got a bit of a civilizational acid you know breaking down whatever's whatever's left in in multiple different areas and i wonder what you think about the possibility of i mean we're i guess we're i'm jumping to the end of a conversation but that we haven't had yet sorry um <laughs> uh but i guess i should lay a little more gr groundwork what uh what are the kind of inev inevitable effects. I mean, obviously we're seeing this with the transgender movement. We're seeing this with all kinds of different kind of Gnostic movements where the, the, the separation of where I can make any kind of alterations to my body. I can make any kind of alterations to society and there won't be any significant impacts because at the end of the day, I can always switch this thing out interchangeably. Uh, what, what are kind of the inevitable impacts of that, that, that we're seeing and what's, and what's going to come? I should say it's. I, I should say I, I'm not really a tech determinist in the sense that I, I do. I I still maintain that we have some agency. I wouldn't bother writing any of the stuff that I write if I didn't think we have some agency. 
um, even even though it's very clear that you know we're of, of course we're we're massively shaped by systemic factors in in our life world. Um, and I, I just uh, by way of caveating anything I say, I've been extremely online for twenty years. You know, I love the internet. <laughs> Uh, you know, probably one of the reasons I write a great deal about the Gnostic temptation, the 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 dream of being able to escape from our meat suits, um, is because it's one that I'm extremely susceptible to. Um, mm. I fell in love with the internet pretty much the moment I the moment I first met it, um, and you know, I, I was I was not a happy. I I got all the way to the end of my teens before the internet happened. Um, but I was not a happy teenager, and if you'd offered me a way of, of escaping into a disembodied realm of, of pure idea, I'd have bitten your arm off. Um, as it was, I was straight in there and sort of didn't didn't really leave the internet for a number of years once I discovered what it was for. Um, so, so when I so so when I'm critical of, of the, the way that that kind of um, the the memeplex has kind of eaten reality, um, I do so from from a kind of hopeless entanglement with it. You know, I'm a fully paid up cyborg. Um, in the sense of in the sense of living at least half of my life at all times yeah, in in the digital in in the discourse, you know, <laughs> that's the, so that that by way of a preface, let's say I'm 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 fairly hopelessly entangled in what I'm critiquing, um, and you know unless I'm, if you're not going to take that as just dis disqualifying me from commenting, um, I mean what I think the sort the sort of two two ways we can two directions we could take thinking about that. One of them is, um, what does it look like if it all goes hopelessly to shit? And, you know, nobody figures out how to how to get to grips with with this demonic technology. And the other question, you know, what 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 means do we still have of exercising agency? And, you know, where, you know, what 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 does what does pockets of resistance look like? So, I mean, at the end of the day, here, here we are having this disembodied conversation across several thousand miles. Yeah. You know, if this isn't if this isn't yet more evidence of, of the cyborg era kind of doing its thing, um, I, I don't really know what is. Um, so, you know, we're all we're all down there in the mess and we're all trying to make some kind of sense of it. Um, and I guess that's I guess this is just where we find ourselves. Um, I mean, the the very succinct, the, the sort of um, aphoristic form. Of, of my my kind of reason to have hope is is that I believe everybody figuratively or literally should lift but never post physique, and I think that's possible, and I think it's I think it's very important. Um, it's it's clear to me from talking to people who are younger than me um, that you know with every generation people are more intentional about what they do and don't share on the internet, um, and the people are much pe and. And it, I mean, it's become very clear, even just in the last few years, um, that a lot of the a lot of the conversations that used to happen in public happen in gate gate kept group chats now, um, for very good reason. Um, and that's not just that's not just about polarization. That's about recognizing that actually there are limits to how open it's possible to be. And this this sort of nineteen sixties fantasy of you know a, a world of total transparency and total openness is just is just a malign fiction. And doesn't really produce the results we thought it would produce. Um, so I see, I'm you know, but I see possibly positive signs of people, people grappling with um, some of the some of the sort of insane potential of digital technologies and communication technologies, and coming coming up with sort of more or less jerry rigged, but actually you know quite hopeful solutions. And I also see I also see a lot of people. You know, more or less successfully in practice, um, experimenting with just unplugging and um, going radically localist. I mean, it seems it's it's it seems it, it might seem like a slight handbrake turn to kind of deviate into you know the the doomer optimists and little subcultures like that, um, who are who are sort of preemptively trying to trying to create the kind of communities which they imagine might be able to survive the, the somebody unplugging the internet. But 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 I see that happening, um, and again, it sort of give, gives me reason to hope. People are thinking, you know, not not very systematically, but they're thinking concretely about, you know, what what do we actually do now that technology seems to have liquefied everything? And the short answer is, you know, this there is nothing left to conserve. That's that that's that ought to be just obvious to everybody now. You know, there's the pointless calling yourself a conservative unless you just don't want to scare politicians. Um, there's nothing left to conserve. The only thing there is left to do is build. Yeah, I'm um, usually conservative when I'm talking to someone who's mainstream. That's the that's the easiest way to. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, no, I, I think it's interesting. Let, let's I want to touch on something right there that I think is really important that you that you mentioned. Uh, first, 
you know, obviously, whenever someone talks about these problems, the first thing, like you said, is like, well, but you're online, you're online talking to people about this. And it's, I think that it's important to, to keep in mind that, yeah, like, obviously, the fact that we're having this conversation on a YouTube channel right now means that neither of us are Luddites, right? So recognizing that there's a long term problem baked into into something doesn't necessarily mean that you are suddenly abandoning, abandoning the world around you, the, the reality around you. And simply because you're engaging with the technology at all doesn't mean you aren't looking for solutions. Um, but but you also use the phrase technology is liquefying everything. And I think that's really important because I've also heard you address a topic that I talk about a lot, which is kind of the destruction of intermediate institutions and centralization. And I think that's a key aspect of what's going on politically, socially, culturally, that just does not get enough uh attention so when you're talking about technology liquefying things and 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 you know this mass centralization can you expand a little more on that for people who might not be familiar um the uh, i think a good rule of thumb for thinking about um, specifically what social media does is that if it, 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 it functions in three stages first it mediates a pre-existing social phenomenon say um a local a local group of some description first it mediates um then it then it replaces whatever it was that it previously mediated and then finally it grotesquely caricatures it and this is a this is a progressive um there's a series of iterations so you start like that you take you take the take the example of a local newspaper for example um facebook might start out um publishing sharing links as, as, as a place where you can where where a local newspaper or a local newspaper might might share links to to news stories, and then all of a sudden um, the newspaper can't survive because everybody's just posting their small ads on Facebook anymore. So at that point, at that point, the, the local Facebook page has replaced the the function that the, that the local newspaper used to do. And then before you know it, um, you have you have you have local Facebook pages which grotesquely grotesquely caricature the previous function of a newspaper in that you know they they spread rumors they're they're a, they're a vehicle for people to fight in um they're they're you they they become they become an easy vector for slander that goes around your neighborhood they font they ferment fear about petty crime and i mean all of all of these are phenomena which i've noticed in my my small towns facebook pages you have to i mean it, it's a great place to find a cleaner if you need a new cleaner um but if you read it all day you'll you'll also it'll also make you deeply miserable because you get the impression that it's a crime-ridden hellhole when it really isn't it's just a nice ordinary british small town in in the shires so 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 i think that's i, I don't know if that that illustrates kind of what i mean and i think you can apply more or less the same heuristic to to any given social media phenomenon that it's been increasing numbers of them have been um, first mediated, then replaced, and then finally grotesquely caricatured. And a great deal of what people just think is really screwy and depressing about contemporary culture is 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 what is what we're looking at when intermediate institutions is. But a lot of what's so depressing is those grotesque caricatures of what what were previously healthy and functioning intermediate institutions. And it was very noticeable to me how much worse this got during the pandemic, when so much more of human life went online. I mean, it was. It was really painful to me to experience just, you know, the, the shuttering of my small town for months on end. Um, and, the, you know, the church groups, the church groups couldn't meet. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the scout groups couldn't meet. The, the kindergartens shut down. There was just nobody around. It was I, I ran a thousand miles that year around the footpaths um, just because it was the whole thing was so crazy making. I just ran. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was running, running for miles and miles and miles every week in this kind of insane kind of hamster energy, and just watching watching the organic civic life of my of my little town just being com com compulsorily shut down, um, forced to shut down, and replaced by replaced by this sort of thin and, to my eye, deeply grotesque um, digital caricature of itself. And well, I'm, and that oh, sorry. I was just going to say, well, and that only becomes possible because of the destruction of those institutions and the remove the removal of making them unnecessary, right? So you you can't shut down civilization that way if you haven't already stripped out the need for your mom and pop st shops and your right. and your churches and that kind of thing because you've created you know everyone can watch a church service online and right. because everyone can order their groceries. Uh, contactless from Walmart and because everyone can get things to their door with Amazon, 
that allows the government to tell people it's okay to shut those things down because they're the the the, the parts of life that they manage and monetize and and you know put into the spreadsheet will continue right and those so those things you, you couldn't have shut society down in the way that they did if they hadn't already laid the groundwork by dissolving all those cultural bonds and removing the necessity of those those uh, medium to small institutions from from the average person's life yeah i think that's absolutely true um i mean, I mean it's I, I know it's quite a different situation in the in the united states and varied a great deal state by state but there was a there was a great deal of argument about whether or not it was legitimate to shut pubs down, and actually I was I'm, I'm happy to say that one that 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 one didn't go entirely to the cyborg theocrats, you know. So some some pubs shut down in the course of it. Some pubs have been struggling anyway, to be honest. Um, but but a, but pub life pub life didn't wholly go away. Um, you know, children's children's daycare came back relatively quickly. Um, it wasn't it wasn't too deranged because there was a there was a great deal of pushback and we weren't we weren't run at that point um entirely we weren't run by a government that was completely indifferent to well i don't know i don't think you can you can probably debate quite quite how what the tories attitude collectively is to any of these issues but but i think there were there were enough sort of old fashioned old fashioned liberals in government at that point that it, it wasn't it wasn't the, the sort of the full we didn't go full New Zealand um, it was a lot less bad here than it was in some places um, but yeah I think it, it it's exact I mean it's I'm incredibly fortunate to live in a small town where we do have a functioning market square and you know people come from people come from location you know miles around just to, to use the to use the butcher's shop because there is one um, you know, it's not it's not just the kind of place where everybody gets their stuff delivered in. I find that actually quite unsettling when I come to America, just how much more like that it is or seems to be. You know, everybody seems to use food delivery apps and everybody seems to use sort of digitally mediated. Um, everyone uses Uber. Um, you know, coverage is seamless. Everything just everything just happens. And it's kind it's great. But I also find it it leaves me feeling slightly queasy, if I'm honest. Um, there's a sense of you know, the, the, the sort of the, the frictionlessness leaves me feeling slippery in a way which is not pleasant. Um, like I, I just I'll find myself just sliding past other people, and there's I don't know. I quite like friction. <laughs> I like a bit of friction. Life is life. Life's sort of a bit creepy without it. Uh, I, I realize I'm, I'm being a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm getting quite incoherent, but I think this is this is precisely what's so difficult about. The, the situation that we find ourselves in, um, and because the, all of these, all of these services, all of these products, all of these developments are entrancing. You know, they're as entrancing as the ability to have a conversation seamlessly across thousands, thousands of miles, or press a button and make pizza happen. Um, you know, all of the, all of these things are enticing and, and really bewitching. There's a fabulous sense of power. I mean, it, it genuinely is indistinguishable from magic. I have no idea how any of it works, and it is basically just magic. Um, and yet. And and what's what what that and and the, but it leaves me with this nagging this sense of we're losing something 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 is not being seen in the context of this something something which actually is whole and is important and is human and is real uh, is not being seen and a lot of the time when I write it's about trying to what I'm trying what I'm sitting there doing kind of banging my head against the wall is trying to turn what I'm looking at inside out so I can see what it is that's missing I can see what it is that's just being unthinkingly kind of push to one side when when we embrace all of these things and celebrate all of these things um you know and i never want to come across as just a kind of furious tub thumping luddite and i think that's that's not a very helpful way to be a reactionary but i think i don't know even if it is just in the tragic mood um we need to we need to be mindful of of, of what's not being seen well i think it's the friction I think yeah. that's that really is friction is life like people yeah. don't we want in our quest for efficiency um we are willing to abandon things that give us identity and definition and meaning and so you know it's it's whether it's technologically or socially our quest for kind of uh, for removing barriers and re relieving burdens has robbed us of lots of those things you know if I, I, if speaking since you discussed lifting, you know, if you if you lift with a machine, if you lift with a particular like isolation machine, 
you'll you'll you know get that muscle you know you'll you'll sculpt that particular muscle and target that particular muscle but what you lose is all of the little you know stabilizers and connective tissue and things that you would have built up if you had physically picked up a barbell and been forced to actually generate that motion more naturally and i think that's kind of a metaphor for what we've done we've decided that because it's so important to to be more efficient and maximize each interaction and each bit of our money and our uh, our energy output we've kind of lost that you know yes like having to go to the church or having to go to your parents or having to interact with your neighbor are it's all very inconvenient and it's all very frustrating and it can cause all of these issues and you'd rather just avoid it half the time but when you do that you lose things you didn't understood stand about the world that made you whole and made you part of the community and brought meaning and, and purpose to your life and i think that's what gets lost as we rush towards this kind of the, this centralization and removal of friction. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what one a theme which I bang on about endlessly is in this context actually is having kids. Um, I was I started, you know, I I I, I drank the Kool Aid, right? You know, I wanted to be free. I wanted to find myself, and so I got married relatively late. Um, I'll probably never have more than my one child. She's six now. She's awesome. Um, having having a child changed my life. Um, you know, it was, it was hard. It was demanding, and it's a, it's an obligation which you can't put down. Like, you know, if you're if you're breastfeeding and your child is screaming in the middle of the night because she's hungry, you can't just roll over and say I don't want to. You just can't. I mean, people do, <laughs> but you can't, yeah. right? Um. So, so that that's immediate. It's a, it's a set of it's a set of bonds. It's a set of it's friction. Um. But, you know, you you could look at it. Oh, yeah. And and I hear, you know, I have I have very dear millennial friends who worry wonder about having kids you know and they're thinking about getting their second dog and you know they're they're totally set you know they have they 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 have an affordable mortgage they have super flexible jobs they 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 have low or zero commutes they're basically you know they have spare rooms that they're in every possible way just you know absolutely sitting pretty to have children they're like oh but i don't know if i want the hassle and i and, you know, i want to shake them and say listen you know, you, you don't get it. Like, you know, what you're, what you're calling hassle is just love. You know, it's the thing that makes it worth getting up in the morning, you know, and I, I sort of, you know, I, I try and try and kind of convey the fact that, you know, yes, it is. Yes. Yes. It is annoying, but also it's just the best thing ever. Um, which I don't know. Maybe, maybe it doesn't, maybe it does, doesn't sound like it makes sense. And to, and to I mean, maybe it's just something you have to do, but I'd say, you know, to anybody who's thinking about it, just do it um because it's it's the best thing um and it's and and i think it's it it's a it's a perfect illustration of where we are um that just nobody wants to do that anymore um and it's not it's not because housing's too expensive come on you know i mean in the middle fucking ages people had 10 kids when you know they were on the brink of starvation you know it's not because housing is too expensive and it's not because you know politics is a bit sketchy and it's not because of any of this, it's not because of the gig economy. Um, it's because people don't want to, because it might be a hassle, because it's it just it introduces friction. That's the fundamental reason. Um, you know, and I'm not I'm not pointing the finger either at men or at women, and this is an immensely complicated, you know, why people don't want to form or can't or feel unable to form long-term relationships and don't feel able to take on the commitment of having children is an immensely complicated thing. And, you know, and, and in a way I kind of see where people are coming from, but it's, but fundamentally it's about that. It's about, we don't, they don't want the friction. Well, I, you know, it's, it reminds me again to, to reference Oswald Spangler. He talks about how once a society kind of becomes intentional about its reproduction, like once parenthood is a choice as something, something to be deliberated upon rather than a natural rhythm of life, something that will inevitably occur. That's kind of the end of the show, right? Like, like there's no, you, there's no way to, to get people to opt in once there's an op once a, there's an option like it that that is what kind of destroys the the kind of the natural momentum that and i think and that's something i think about a lot because we're you know this uh, you know not just parenthood but every aspect of life pretty much everyone is given the option to de to defect at every moment right to just kind of opt out of uh, social bonds and and duties and everything at every level and uh, that option is only increasing and the incentives are only increasing. And I wonder if it's even possible to arrest this slide 
um, you know, there will be some people who find, you know, there will be, there will be people who find, you know, uh, ways to, you know, create the monastery, you know, separate themselves from, you know, unplug, you know, find different paths forward. But I wonder, you know, outside of kind of those enclaves, is there a way for civilizations to actually intentionally return to a situation where they they choose those obligations because it seems at least at the, at the moment the only thing that makes me think that's possible is is literally just collapse as a system is that is that the option to remove yourself from that no longer exists right in a morbid way one of the counterfactuals that i find really interesting to track at the moment on this front is china mm. um uh, because um, a great, great many of the phenomena which conservatives in the West are prone to blaming on feminism um, also exist in China. But there, rather than being an effective, rather rather than coming looking like an effective feminism, they're 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 basically a cause of feminism. So to, to, just to explain, um, in the in the West, you know, right wingers are keen. Are, are, often to be found blaming phenomena like atomization, family breakdown, falling birth rates, yada, 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 divorces, et cetera, and so on. They're keen to blame all of that on, on, fem on those selfish feminists, right? Um, but atomization, family breakdown, shrinking families, um, collapsing birth rates are also, also happening in China, except they were, they were imposed in a top-down way by um, Chinese governments who wanted to push populations away from traditional extended family lifestyles in an agrarian setting into an urban environment where they could where they could staff the new factories and power power China's move into the economic boom right um, it's a downstream of all of that families get smaller because uh, you know you don't you no longer have granny and granddad around you have the one child policy which which tanked birth rates and which also empowered women um, because all of a sudden, you know, a, a whole load of women who would once have been married off and, you know, sent, sent in, you know, become traditional wives and mothers are now the, the, the family's only child. And so they have to take on the filial duties, which means that they have to be successful in career terms, which means they then resent the expectations of the of any of, of a traditional Chinese man, you know, that they that they should, you know, become a wife and a mother and not not fulfill their professional potential, etc. And so on. And so. Um, a lot of a lot of the phenomena which are blamed on feminism in the West um, in, look a great deal like a cause of feminism in the East, and the common factor in both is techno capital. Um, mm -hmm. the, the 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 social order which dissolves all previous um, social and even embodied norms in pursuit of in, in pursuit of, of growth, fundamentally economic growth. You know, more more whatever. More money, more money, more more industry, more stuff, more I don't know, whatever progress. Yep. I mean, did, like line go up, you know, whether it's the moral line or the or the money line, you know, that's a, that, that's a matter of aesthetics, really, or whether you're standing on the left left flavored progressive or the right flavored progressive. But it, it's it's the same line basically. You're just looking I, at it slightly differently. I definitely want to explore that more because that's that's a that was that was part of my in question. But I want to put a <laughs> pin right there because I want to get get one more thing in before we kind of get to get to that i think what be a natural uh concludes uh conclusion or a to for a topic there but uh you you've mentioned the phrase cyborg theocracy and we haven't really uh stopped to kind of define and, and unpack that a little bit uh, i think you've touched around the edges of what it means but could you explain for people kind of what what you're talking about there um it's not it's not my coinage i should say um I, is it I james borrow, Poulos? uh james Poulos uses it also Argentola, um, okay. canonic and and a, a, a friend of both of theirs, um, one Mark Wilcox, who's, a, who's another technologist based in New Zealand. Um, I, I, I've no idea where the meme originated, but it, it originates in that in that corner and that that grouping. Um, I like it um, because to me it captures. I don't think it it doesn't need very precise definition because I, I I suspect you can feel it. You you have a you have a good kind of emotional sense of what it means as much as I do. Um, you know, it's it's drones in the sky. Um, writing out um, pro-abortion messages mm. um it's it it's it's abba appearing on stage and it'd be like boomer abba appearing on stage as as uh, holograms for their comeback tour um it, it's it's the entire ngocracy which is busy rolling out lgbt rights across the entire world um it's 
it's the entire infrastructure of people who are who whose sole purpose in life it now is to terraform your your moral instincts to in in accordance with the belief that there is no such thing as human nature it's it, that that entire that entire you know pervasive edifice and all of the technologies that underwrite it um, taken together is sort of the, the 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 all this that i'm kind of waving at when i pointing out in a incoherent deranged crazy haired way when i say cyborg theocracy I don't know if that gives you a, gives you a sense. No, of where we are. no, absolutely. No, that's. I just wanted to to kind of nail that down because the, then my next question is going to be. Uh, sorry for anyone who is plugging in here for the white pills, but the, <laughs> you're you're in the wrong stream. You came to the wrong place. You should know better by now. Um. So Nick Land talks about accelerationism, and mm -hmm. he talks about the uh you know techno capital and the drive for progress dissolving all these traditional barriers and 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 all the incentives to separate communities and cultures and, and keep traditional forms. And he says that eventually we get to this point where capital is just interacting in development in a way or in tech, uh, interacting with technology in a way that completely removes the need for actual human input into the system, right? Like you have this situation where uh, kind of your, uh, your market forces are uh, are driving human responses more than human responses are driving market forces. And like you said, they get so good at terraforming your moral uh, instincts that you they're completely you know removed from any actual uh, context in interacting with other people. And this also becomes true of all of your you know your your needs for purchasing and and sex and relationships and and everything else. And eventually these decisions are being made entirely kind of free from the kind of the human in input into this. And that just accelerates the process faster and faster because you no longer actually need to involve the human in, in kind of the decision making tree, uh, which just allows you to keep optimizing each one of these technologies uh, while uh, while making sure that they're best at preying on people and then feeding that back into a loop. I, I don't know if the how does cyborg theocracy end right like how does what what do you think do you think that it inevitably hits a limit of like the ability of our technology and infrastructure to carry its weight and our like our culture to carry its weight or you know does it just end up farming us in a matrix like system here like what how how does that work at the end i know that where it's all speculation but but what do you think and the, there are several there are several possible outcomes you know perhaps the least worst is that the, the the greta thunberg is right about peak oil you know that might not be the worst outcome really you know if we're <laughs> i mean if you think if you think about it um you know the end of cheap fossil fuels is the end of most of this actually because it's mm -hmm. the end of plastics and it's the end of um well most manufacturing and it's the end of um it's it's the end of churning out cyborgs in large enough quantities really to be moving the political needle um i mean you know should 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 we end up on that timeline you know it's going to suck for most of us right because you know at that point we're in sort of uh, the most likely outcome i can see is not is not the kind of that we end up in some sort of you know post you know some, some kind of global communist hippie commune I think that's extremely unlikely, you know, based on my <laughs> slightly downbeat view of human nature. I think that's it's probably kind of horrible resource wars for a couple of centuries, followed by something like Guillaume Fay's archaeofuturism, where, you know, a few a few people live, you know, a, a minority of people, the Eloi live in gated communities and the Morlocks are, I don't know, in some kind of Mad Max scenario or possibly sub a, a subsistence peasanthood again. I don't know. I mean, that's that's one that's one possible black pill, but it might not be the worst of them, really. Um, you know, it's, it's maybe, maybe you know there, there, there there's definitely there's definitely a whole meme subculture dedicated to the idea that actually life as a life as a surf wasn't so bad, really. I do appreciate that techno feudalism is the good yeah. outcome. That's the good ending for this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so I don't know why I'm laughing hysterically at this point. I guess we, you and I, were always going to go down this rabbit hole when we had finally had the conversation. Um, like, what's 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 worse? I mean, you know the the, the 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 swarm machine takes over and peak oil is somehow rendered not a problem is possibly a worse outcome in my you know because that that kind of is the the matrix scenario um 
I, I don't, I actually don't think that's, or, I mean, or, or I don't know, why not both? Um, you know, so the world is a big place, you mm. know, <laughs> we might end up with both of them in diff both of these outcomes in different places. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think we're going to end up with some kind of um, globalized total AI theocracy. I just, I don't, I don't know. I think, I think the promise of technology it never quite delivers. Um, you know, for, for one thing, you know, it's it, it's singularly failed to abolish human nature. Every single one of the technologies which promise to liberate us from the bounds of our nature um, have only all that all they've really done um, is is get rid of the social norms we had for managing that that facet of our nature and, and, and reordered it to the market. That's all that ever happens. You know, male and female sexual desire is different, but it hasn't that hasn't stopped being true just because we invented contraception. And now we just have Tinder and um, uh, and Pornhub. <laughs> and it's and it's you know they all, all all the same all the same stereotypes are still true about male and female sexuality they just they, they just play out in this horrible frictionless marketplace instead um and that that goes for pretty much any facet of human nature you care to you care to name and given this um i think the idea that the machines will somehow be able to te mind terraform us into being kind of compliant kind of com compliant bots you know sitting in you know, in, in our pods eating bugs um I, I think that's. I think they're being very optimistic about what 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 the machine is actually capable of delivering, based on based on how how successfully it's managed to um, terraform away, for example, male sexual aggression. You know, <laughs> this is self evidently not been very successful, right? Um, and also, I think I think people's people's capacity for subversion can't be underestimated. You know, I mean, I've, I'm I'm fond of making the point that no fap is one of the most radical um, anti-capitalist movements out there. <laughs> you know, they're infinitely, infinitely more subversively anti-capitalist than any of the tankies, like tweeting about capitalism, tweeting about Lenin from their iPhones while yeah. whining about how their Starbucks order is, is not, not delivering fast enough. Yeah, um, far more radically anti-capitalist than your Che Guevara shirt from Hot Topic, yeah. Too fucking right. Yeah, you know this. I mean, you know, the, there is there is no more. There is there is you know, talk about being right at the coalface of limbic capitalism, and 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 these guys these guys are using technology to support one another to to unplug themselves from that machine, and that is a difficult machine. I mean, I'm not a guy, so I can't speak to this personally, but I understand from male friends that this is a difficult machine to unplug from because it's a very very basic drive, right? Um, and, and these, but these guys are doing it, and I think there's something amazing and heroic about that. I find it, I get quite get quite emotional when I think about it. And then, and then you also have to remember that these these are the guys who still has have a fighting chance of actually finding find, forming families and having kids. So you know, from from a straightforward evolutionary point of view, um, technology is selecting against the bugman. Yeah, maybe right. the the most important evolutional uh, uh, selection will be for the ability to avoid Skinner boxes, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly, 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 exactly. You know, there's it, it's it, it's increasingly adaptive to be able to unplug yourself from the Skinner box. Um, and pretty much the only people who are going to make it are the ones who find some way. And, uh, and, you know, there are plenty of different ways because there are there, there are as many different Skinner boxes as there are um, as there are personality types. There are a thousand and one ways of plugging yourself into the into the dopamine machine. Um, but but pe people find a way. I mean, my my personal heroine is long distance running and you know it's a it's it, it's a delicate balance but if if i don't if i don't run i can't be online it's as straightforward as that and you know there are and i although i again i can't speak to it personally my sense is there are a lot of guys who lift for similar reasons and there are yeah. there are a bunch of other re other ways you can approach the same the same balance you can find find the same exit um, but 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 that matters, and I think there's you know the the people who who can't find a way of doing that are not going to make it, and mm. and but and and the people who are finding a way to do that are the ones who stand a chance of actually um, having social lives and friends and you know and if it does all go to shit they're the ones who'll be able to look after each other. No, I think that's absolutely true. Well, we're coming up near an hour. Do you mind if we uh, take a look at some of our uh, questions we have here from the audience? Sure. All right, let's see. Uh, Scratchy McDump Waffle for $2. Welcome to the stream. Uh, so, so Oren, just uh, casually bring tech priests on. Yes, absolutely. That's 100% correct here. 40K reference for all those who are uninitiated. 
Uh, let's go to Glow in the Dark here for $5. Cybernetics is uh, too ripe for abuse. We need a clear understanding of what it can do and how far we should allow it to go. I mean, I think that's true, Glow in the Dark. The, I, the, the biggest problem is, of course, that self-control, right? Like, we can't stop ourselves from creating viruses that can, like, wipe out a good chunk of the population just because science and we should do it right we we if we can go there we're going to go there and that's this is always the problem right like i think about you know uh nations that were successful in limiting their technological uh advancement and their cultural uh you know uh exchanges places like japan and china eventually you know a Commodore shows up with a gunboat and it doesn't matter anymore, right? Like that, that, that's a real problem that you have to address. I think there is a lot to be said about limiting these things and controlling these things. But the, the two edged sword of technology is always if you try to limit it too much, if you try to try to completely close yourself off and remove yourself from something, eventually those who have embraced it end up outpacing you. And I think that's a real problem that. Uh, in anyone who's talking about the things we're talking about has to address in their solution. But Mary, what do you think about that? Uh, I suppose that to give it a slightly, slightly less geopolitical and slightly more domestic context, this is something I think about every day, you know, how far you know, in the context of, you know, to what extent do I allow my six year old contact with the Internet? You know, this is a live question for me and will carry on being a live question for me. Um, and because I mean, at the end of the day, this is the world, you know, we live in the world we live in. Um, and if I could, I could just shut her in a bubble, but the chances are um, she'd, she'd leave that bubble eventually. Um, and I, I don't have a well-worked answer. I don't have a well-worked out answer for where, where you draw the line, except to say, um, I think we could, we, we could do a lot better at being explicitly paternalistic in some contexts about the proper uses of technology and who it's for and who can be given free reign with it. Um, and that's that's an extremely difficult conversation to have in a sort of you know hegemonically liberal culture, which says that you know everybody's everybody's functionally the same in every meaningful way, um, even even to the and we're, we're willing to pursue and you know litigate that point even to the extent of pretending that a 12 year old has total grasp of their identity, such as to be able to consent to irreversible iatrogenic harms. Because because of gender fields, for example, um, so so and it's very difficult in that context to say to to make a case that no, actually we just need to be paternalistic and say no, you can't have this because we don't think you're capable of handling it. But but perhaps but but perhaps that's that is a conversation that we need to be having more explicitly. I mean, it's 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 well known, for example, the Silicon Valley um, oligarchs, you know, all, all ban their children from having more than the most yeah. glancing contact with smartphones, um, and but perhaps we just need to. We just need to watch what what watch what the tech bros are doing, not what not what they say. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, let's see here. Uh, Glow in the dark again for five dollars. I expect a major ad campaign by companies that will magnify teenage insecurity and body dysmorphia to get kids to adapt to cybernetics in the future. I think we call that the transgender movement. But uh, <laughs> what do you think, Mary? Uh, yeah, I think that's it's already here, um, yeah. and it's been. Um, and one of one of the most effective methods by which this is this is rolled out in schools um, is via um, diversity and inclusion charities who who install this stuff in 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 the programming of individual schools such that such that it just then just gets rolled out um, as part of wanting to be a nice friendly inclusive place um, and that and that stuff is very difficult to push back against because you just look like a dick. You know, you look like a homophobe, which, you know, most most people genuinely aren't. Most people just don't care about about gay and lesbian people, because why would you? It's just not, not a big deal. Um, but you know, whilst also being deeply concerned about the idea that somebody could be telling my, my, my child that they that they can literally change sex when they're too young to understand what the implications of that are. Um, yeah, I think it's a, those the, those sort of the, the, those are straightforwardly kind of, you know, missionary, the, the, the evangelical shock troops of cyber theocracy. Uh, but I mean, you know, coming at it from another angle, you know, magnifying teenage insecurity and body dysmorphia, you know, if you want to talk about things which are, you know, heightening, heightening sort of you know, adolescent Gnosticism, you could do worse than look at something like Minecraft or Roblox, 
you know, which is a, a, a totally a totally parallel universe where a lot of very young children spend a lot of time. Um, and it's I, I just don't think it's that surprising that a lot of them just take it completely as self-evident that you can update you ought to be able to update your meat avatar just like you can update your digital one um having having spent a great deal of their of their childhood socializing in virtual realms i want to ask you something there because you, you kind of sped through it real quick do you find do you do you not think there is a linkage between kind of the normalization of the idea that a child would or then eventually adult would choose their sexual orientation or, or have an alternative there. And then the transgender movement, do you not think that there's a, there's a natural linkage and progress in kind of the adaption of those attitudes? That's very, that's, I mean, we could do a whole nother, a whole nother hour. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I understand that's hard to answer the, in like two minutes, but the, 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 gay movement and the trans movement because it's because uh, the two are the two are radically at odds you know i mean i i have i have friends and acquaintances who are gay or lesbian and are deeply concerned by by this incursion of of uh, as they put it spicy straights well um, the revolution got to something they cared about right like that's right. the problem um but i th i mean there, there are a lot of different there are a lot of different ways of looking at and i'm going to speak i'm going to speak quite carefully here I understand, because no I'm, I'm on extremely radioactive territory um sure sure and it's very easy to slip um i think that a great deal of um what looks self-evidently right and just in the gay liberation movement, just as in feminism, is downstream of the same socio-cultural changes, which are also downstream of technology. Um, again, I think a, 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 a lot of the contemporary paradigm is very straightforwardly, um, well, it, it's very difficult to, un, to disconnect it from the technology which separates sex from reproduction. Mm -hmm. You know, if it, if 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 sex is if sex is not self evidently going to result in babies, then why shouldn't why what and, and it's just something it's a sort of industrialized leisure activity that you know a low 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 cost low impact harmless leisure activity. Then why should it be anybody's business what anybody else does in bed? And right. there are other cultures where sex is considerably more consequential in some contexts where people just really don't look at it that way at all. Mm -hmm. So I I suppose that 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 would be that would be my comment. You know, they yes yes the the our entry into the transhumanist era um has has triggered a, a great a great many of these changes and 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 a lot of the a logic of them um kind of links up at the back yeah continues there gotcha all right so laughing gas i'm not sure what the denomination there is but thank you very much thoughts on ai art technology weaponizing uh, weaponized against elite gatekeepers of art culture it can look classically beautiful and make modern artists seethe. Uh, that's interesting, you know, because I'm I'm just not, you know, I'm a philistine here uh, when it comes to the visual arts, so I'm probably not going to speak with any um, with any great uh, alacrity kind of on that. But I would say my first instinct would be that AI art, if used correctly, could uh, could have some some utility there. I worry. Uh, would if you're really trying to uh, address kind of the subversion of beauty that maybe gatekeepers in the modern art world have kind of imposed, it feels like leaning into completely AI art goes against that. But again, I'm I'm not really well versed enough in this topic to 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 say anymore. I haven't. I've I've had only the most glancing contact with. Um, it, stable diffusion um visuals um i mean I, I i track i track some of the some of the meme accounts on twitter and that's about as far as it goes um i'll say very honestly um that a lot of the stuff that i see just straight up makes my skin crawl um there's a, com a completely visceral reaction um it makes my skin crawl and because there's something there's something so profoundly creepy to me about a machine looking sort of synthesizing human creative output and trying to come up with something plausible that looks like it um and just getting it subtly wrong i think although i mean the the most the most powerful and impactful output of ai art technology was that 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 series of loab images i don't remember i don't know if you remember them or 
um, this, this this sort of demonic woman surrounded by mutilated, monstrous, mutant children who just seem to come out repeatedly as a, a, a so somebody somebody put in. Um, I think it was Marlon Brando and then inverted it and then inverted it again, like you'd sort of said Marlon Brando backwards into a mirror three times and came up with this sort of demonic woman with rosacea on her cheeks who appeared in these sort of steadily more horrifying images. And there was something there was something tremendously powerful about them in, in all of their disturbingness um, in a way that felt more, more genuinely um, a product of that medium than anything else that I'd seen. Um, and if I mean that again. That this might just be might just be my prejudice and my aesthetics. But if if that's if that's actually what the machine wants to make, then I don't think it's on our side. Would be yeah. <laughs> no. Luckily, I, I did not see that. But uh, yeah, no. That, that I mean, look, it, look it up. Look. I mean, you know, not not when you've just eaten. But I was going to say up. maybe I won't. I appreciate yeah, that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, I might just yeah, avoid maybe. that experience I, I, yeah actually maybe just don't yeah <laughs> after having it described to me i think i might yeah, just, just move, move right on past that uh all right here uh ramble gamble here for five dollars thank you very much looks like this is a two-part question but we'll try to address it one at a time here uh what do effective elites look like Thiel, bannon as a class are you listeners uh list, uh are your listeners the pro elite that uh or maybe that's supposed to be proto elite that should start uh, right-leaning companies. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, questions there, right? And there's a large amount of we've you know we've had a lot of discussions in kind of this sphere about what that looks like. What does an effective counter elite look like? Where do they come from? Where do they apply pressure? That kind of thing. Uh, we're in this situation where I think obviously like we're in the ba battle of the oligarchs, right? And so it's it's guys like. Feel and Musk, you know, throwing money against people like that. For better or for worse, the form of our civilization has become that of just uh, just powerful billionaires and, and trillion, you know, whatever. Um, and so I think that's uh, that's going to be the form of that right now, at least that kind of inter elite co competition looks like. I don't know that that will always be the case. I don't know that we will forever be ruled by kind of our merchant class. And, um, you know, the shift between here and there would be quite jarring. So it's kind of hard for people to envision a scenario, even though for the vast majority of human history, we weren't ruled by people like this. I think it's hard for people to envision a future where we would be ruled in any other manner. Uh, so I think that is very difficult. As to our whether listeners here are kind of that proto-elite? I mean, one would hope so. I mean, I know there are many people who are in these spheres who are connected to this kind of thing and do work toward this, those kind of ends. And you should be working to better yourself no matter what. You should be working on becoming worthy if only because that's what's good for you and that's what God calls you to do and that's what's going to be best for your family and the people around you. Whether that grows you into an elite class, well, you know, like Mary has mentioned many a time, the things that might be selected for are the ability for you to deny yourself contact with some of these forms, right? And so maybe at some point that is what is necessary of people to become elite is those that have been able to separate themselves from the Skinner boxes and and from uh, kind of you know, unplug themselves or at least at, and at some level remove themselves from the effects of modern technology. Uh, where I think all of us are, are exploring those things right now. But one thing is for sure, we're going to need people like that. And so I think that's always a good goal for you personally, even if it doesn't shape into some immediate impact and the, the ruling elite. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's abundantly clear that social change, as such, does never really come out as a as a purely bottom up uh, phenomenon. It just doesn't have doesn't have doesn't go that way. Um, how, what form exactly some kind of effective counter elite is taking? I think it's a bit early to say. Um, and in as much as things are happening, that it's, it's pretty much, it's mostly relatively below the radar. Um, this is probably all I'd all I'd want to say about that. But just sort of homing in on one particular facet of that, which I, I really think is under discussed, with pre present company accepted, um, is just how confused, to my eye, the right is on technology. Um, you know, this is a conversation which is really only just starting to happen. Um, but if you think about, for example, figures like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, for example, they're both straight up transhumanists. Mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of the guys who are sort of cheering them on as sort of based and whatever um really wouldn't necessarily consider themselves in in that in in that light at all you know you get you get sort of you know, 
well, the, the the guys with kind of you know traditional Catholic in the in their Twitter profiles banging the drum for somebody who wants to in, implant neural Neuralink in our brains. Right. I'm like, I mean, does it, we need to chat. And I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of I'm slightly, slightly flippantly. I say, I, I feel like there's a throwdown that hasn't happened yet between the Theolite space fascists and the Tolkienite Hobbit post-liberals. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but I mean, you know, I mean, it's, and that's a, I mean, you know, obviously Peter Thiel is not actually a fascist just for the avoidance of doubt and don't sue me. Um, but but you're like there's a the, the, the sort of you know the kind of techno techno optimist like the the authoritarian techno optimists you know of which there are you know there are definitely subcultures like that on the right just as there are on the left um, and then there's you know the sort of the guys who mumble about distributism and you know localism and they read Wendell Berry and they they want they kind of want ecological collapse because they've got a few acres and they think it'll probably be okay. Um, and yeah, you know, these these guys are all somehow theoretically in the same movement, and I, I I feel like they're not really talking to each other at the moment. And there is there are possibly some really quite major major kind of disagreements there that I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe now is not the moment for for picking fights, but I, but I feel like there are some fundamental contradictions there which probably need to be explored a little bit more. Yeah, actually, this goes for for those who need the deep lore. This goes way back to uh, to Spandrel's uh, neo reactionary trichotomy. Like this has been a debate that's happening for been happening for a long time on kind of the the deep internet right on on these different things and has in no way been resolved and it is not getting resolved as the conversation has become more popular and mainstream. Uh, people are just running parallel, um, which you know uh, is fine. Uh, uh, not, not to make allusions to the Spanish Civil War, but you know. <laughs> the, the, these sides, neither neither the sides of the left or the right actually were one movement, one thing. Uh, all of them had different objectives. They only coalesced together because they were kind of pushing in the same uh, direction. And for better or for worse, these things tend to be hashed out at the end, not the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Ramble Gamble here for $5, his second part of this. Thank you very much. Uh, does the counter elite mirror current elites? Uh, Harvard defectors or completely new power centers. Uh, again, I think it starts with your Harvard defectors. It starts with your people who have uh, roots in kind of this, uh, the, these uh, uh, pre-existing institutions. But I think uh, over time, it gets more and more to be away from those. I think you, it has to be just naturally. And also part of the reason you even have counter elites in the first place is those institutions are failing, right? Like the whole reason you even get like, the vast majority of people would just love to be plugged into power and receive status. Like most people do not just, um, you know, artificially opt out of like wealth and status and power because, you know, they're, they're just countercultural, uh, no matter what our kind of current uh, narrative says about uh, the nature of countercultural uh, uh, kind of impulses. The vast majority of people would rather just like go to these elite institutions, get a great job, have a great life, that kind of thing. The reason people look outside of them generally is because people of ability are being denied paths forward. That's what actually usually generates your your counter elite and then your, your eventual circulation of elites is you have a number of people who uh, have the capability of being elites, have the, the potential uh, and are being denied the option due to, you know, whatever it is uh, that Harvard selects for, uh, which I think is currently being hashed out in the American Supreme Court right now. So you can probably figure that out. Uh, but I think uh, I think you will you do see a mirror at the beginning, but uh, we will see more and more people growing different power centers outside of those structures because the ones that exist right now are denying too many people of talent and skill access to kind of those uh, elite institutions and, and the uh, the opportunities that exist uh, once you've gone through them. And because those institutions are losing credibility as they continue to do things like push pandemic narratives that you know don't work out. Yeah, I would add to that that um, in addition to um, several several new or newish organizations that I'm aware of who've, who whose remit is explicitly to to form people capable of wielding power within some putative you know, regime, which is not the current one. Um, yeah, so that's that's one aspect of this phenomenon. But another thing which I think is interesting and kind of a wild card on this front is just how hostile an environment the academy has become to genuine scholars. Um, by which I mean um, the entire class of people who used to kind of you know hide in academia, who are basically more interested in people in ideas than in people. And I mean, you know, you, there are there are there are 
there there are other crude stereotypes that you see more often online for that personality type but it's a you know it's a it's a genuine personality type and for a, for a very long time and most of those people found some kind of refuge in academia um and there, there's just no place for them anymore because the entire the you know the, the faculty as much as as much as the the bureaucracy is run by the same kind of administrator um, and if you're not good at politics and you're not good at crybullying and you're not good at in the, the, the interpersonal stuff, you just you just won't survive. And in any case, there's absolutely no, you know, the entire the entire or, the entire order is set up to focus not on what's true, but on what's good. And if you if you have that personality type, you just can't. That's intolerable. It's fundamentally intolerable. Um, and so one, one thing which I find really interesting um, and, and again, genuinely inspiring is the fact that there are now entire academic networks which have gone feral. Uh, and you know, and they they exist in discords, and they exist in um, you know, in sort of group chats, and they exist in various kind of you know informal organisations like this. You know, and, and some you know, sometimes all you have to do is poke one of these guys, and they'll they'll give you like ten thousand words on some incredibly obscure corner of ancient history. I mean, you you know the guys I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, th sure, there are the you can you can if you have a totally informal academic network of course you can get some quality problems at the fringes but it's also it's also all it's just what there is now it's all there is and these people are the only ones who are keeping scholarship alive you know in a lot of fields um and i think i think that's a real wild card when it comes to when it when it comes to the future of culture um because yeah. i because <laughs> there because there really are there, there really are no no boundaries on those communities in terms of what is or is not sayable um, yeah, certainly those, not the conventional ones. Those Discord monast monasteries get a little uh, wild. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just so, and I think it's it's totally unpredictable. You know what impact that's going to have downstream on the culture, but I think it will be significant. Absolutely. All right. So uh, Ramble Gamble again. Thank you. Says uh, no need to go over those questions. They're evergreen. Well, good news. We we went over them anyway, but I appreciate that. Uh, really do, and they were good questions. So thank you very much. Here, um, let's see. Uh, Paul A here for $5. My biggest concern is that the forces of techno capital are intent on producing fungible humans completely interchangeable with anyone else. And yeah, this is a core, you know, this is a core problem, uh, that I focused on a lot of things. I know Mary is, is touched on too, but this is a, a particular concern. Um, again, on a number of levels, it's, you know, do you, the massification of society and the centralization of society, it, it just, again, it's the removal of friction that creates the requires the fungibility, right? Like if you're going to produce, if the managerial class are going to produce, do their miracle of, of efficiency, they need you to be a, an interchangeable widget. You can't have personalities. You can't have like cultural needs or particularities that slow down and, and, you know, make their job of managing you more difficult, that kind of thing. And so it becomes more and more necessary as this process continues, not just not just technologically, but socially. And it, basically every form of institution that currently operates in our society is looking more and more towards making people, you know, uh, less less contextual and um, more open to manipulation and, and proper management by removing kind of those roots. And, and this leads in again to all of the intermediate institutions that we talked about in the friction, all those things that give you meaning, give you purpose and give you identity and make human life something worth living are also all the things that make you really inconvenient to large corporations and governments and, and, and educational institutions and everything else. And so I think you are right that the, that is kind of the natural inclination of pretty much every institution we have right now is to drive us towards this uh, interchangeable human with no roots, uh, no, no connections, no requirements that are particular to their culture, their region, their faith, anything like that. I suppose what I would say about this is, that, yes, absolutely, that's, that's true. Um, it's also possible to the extent, um, to, to in direct proportion to how close you are to um, the centers of current power, um, current year, current regime power. Um, just one one of the many 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 reasons which I that I appreciate living in small town Britain is that life life here just isn't like that. Um, but if I you know on the occasion on the on the occasions where I get on a plane, um, I feel the kind of you know the pressure to be fungible 
kind mm. of, you know, closing in around me pretty much the moment the taxi dropped in, pretty much the moment I get into the taxi. I mean, it's, it's, I'm still, I'm still in human world with, in the taxi because we we know, we know the guy and I see him in the pub and I know, I know what his dog is called. And, you know, we, we he's, a, you know, he's a friend. Um, but then the moment he drops me at the airport, I'm in frictionless, impersonal world. Um, you know, I don't, I don't speak or even exchange eye contact with anybody else. You know, there's everything, everything is seamless as long as you've got the money to make it so. Um, and you know, the, 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 the systems are set up to process you just as another, another unit, um, in, in a series of data flows. Um, and international travel is just like that. Um, but, it, but I suppose the thing, the thing to remember is that it's a, it's a set of processes that interpolate you in that way. And the moment you step outside of an order, which makes sense in those terms, or even just, you know, withdraw a little bit from, from large cities, particularly. Um, large, large cities in the developed world, life just doesn't work like that uh, because the Wi-Fi isn't good enough. And actually, yeah. in order to get things done, you know, you have to go to the local shop. You know, you can't you can't you can't get delivery where I live. Um, the, the life just isn't like that. You know, I talk to you know if I want if I want X, I have to you know I, like but life life here doesn't work without human human scale interaction. Um, and and I suppose and I. I probably, I'd, I think I'd just extend that to. I'm, I'm willing to bet that pretty much everywhere outside big cities still functions more or less like that. And some places are, yeah, sure, some places are struggling. And you know, yes, there are there are drug problems in rural America, and you know, we have county lines operations here. And um, you know, the the non-urban world is not without its not not without its problems um, under the under the current order. But uh, but I think you know the the power of technology to terraform all of us just just attenuates. The further you get from from sort of concentrations of of you know, from the data centers, to put it figuratively. Yeah, if it helps at all, guys, uh, it, it takes a vast amount of infrastructure uh, to generate the forces that you're talking about. And like Mary said, the further you get outside of those uh, those population centers, the harder it is for that infrastructure to get there. And um, the good slash bad news is that our elites are really really focused on destroying the class of people who maintain that infrastructure. <laughs> um, like that's like a, a high priority is to, is to just nuke the chuds from orbit. And so eventually, um, you know, gender studies degrees don't get your plumbing fixed and they don't run cable, uh, and, and those kind of things. Uh, and so there, there is a lack of ability. One of the main problems we have, of course, is that our institutions are designed to kind of hoover all the people, um, all of our kind of possible elites out of those regional areas and funnel them into the population centers. And so this is where we kind of, uh, we kind of get those, um, um, I'm looking for the term I'm losing it. Anyway, uh, though, the point is that the currently our problem is that our institutions are really looking to just scoop those people up and drop them, uh, into, uh, into those population centers and create that, uh, effect as much as possible. But eventually that kind of falls apart. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you know, uh, getting out of, uh, you know, cities is generally, I think probably good advice. Uh, so let's see, uh, Hugo R, uh, asks, uh, Mary Harrington, which college and what subject? I'm not sure if that was your initial education or what that reference is there, but which, which college did I go to and what subject? That's what I'm guessing. I, I'm not sure there's not enough context for that, but uh, I'd, I'd answer it that way. <laughs> yeah. I, I went to Lincoln college in Oxford, funnily enough, the same, the same college in the same year as our current prime minister, which was unexpected. Um, and I read English literature. Well, I went up to read French and German, and then I changed. I changed course after a year, despite having having not studied English at A level because I just really wanted to read English, and I, I got lucky. Uh, I talked fast to the professor of English, so I got to do that. I I mean, it's 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 a, the, the the most spectacularly useless degree, but I don't regret doing it at all um, because I just wanted. It was the last opportunity I was going to get to just read books uninterrupted for three years, and I and I just wanted that. So. Uh, yeah, I don't regret leaving the academy, though. Absolutely, yeah. No, I've got the degree in political science, and I feel the same <laughs> way. Yeah, it's, I, yeah. Had eventually, I guess I figured out how to use it, but uh, took took quite a while here. Same, uh, same. Yeah. It took a while. <laughs> so, glow in the dark here for twenty dollars. Uh, I mean, by by dysmorphia is more like I can't do math well. Let's add a chip to help, or you can run slow ad cyborg legs to be a cheater. Yeah. Sorry. Glow in the dark. I was kind of being, I was being glib there when I, when I answered it before I, I knew where you were going. That makes total sense. Uh, growing dependence for bodily function 
uh, is dangerous and will turn people into literal NPCs. Yeah, I mean, there. This is what a lot of great science fiction is about, right? There's so many stories where the where this is the uh, the kind of the end uh, result of people trying trying to augment themselves into this. And you know, there's there's going to be even more and more demand of this as our economy is completely based on your ability to manipulate information and it stratifies more and more based on, you know, kind of IQ and your ability to, to do in information style tasks. And so I think um, there will be more and more demand uh, for this uh, long term. I don't know if that will be the, honestly, I don't think that's going to be the primary driver of that though. I think it's going to be social acceptability uh, that's gonna that's really gonna drive that force more than anything. But I didn't know if I don't know if we can expand any more on that, Mary. We kind of talked about it a little bit, but I I don't know how hmm. how credible it will have. You know, open human augmentation is ever going to be. Hmm. Um, I mean, sort of transhumanist type human augmentation. Um, I mean, we we already have. Um, Gen gene editing for in in big fertility right you know i mean in the sense of you know pe perhaps people are not fiddly crispering their babies yet well didn't did somebody crisper his baby i'm not i don't know maybe i'm making that up maybe he was just threatening to crisper his baby anyway uh those are the obviously of, clearly there are people who want to who want to crisper human babies and clearly that's a monstrous thing to do um but you know there are i mean gene gene selective breeding eugenics is already a sort of fairly routine feature of of the fertility industry um and you know and it's plausible that over time you know a sort of eloy uh, you know an, an eloy superbreed might might emerge with with quite distinctive characteristics from the rest of us although again you know if they don't if they don't in the process evolve the capacity to unplug from skinner boxes they're still not going to make it but i mean you know there was that there was that story of the of the disabled child born to a surrogate mother in hungary who was abandoned by the commissioning the commissioning the par the parents you know the the, the adults who'd, who'd who'd rented the uterus to gestate her and this this poor child was just left in an orphanage being cared for by by a, a compassionate nurse um happily hap I mean, the story has a happy ending because she's now been adopted by a by a by, by a, an actual couple who are going to take care of her um but this is this is this is already happening, and I think I think it's easy to look at the science fiction, you know, the cheetah legs or the or the or the microchips in in our brains, and forget like the the, the wearable the wearable technology, and and the the the, the ubiquitous the, the ubiquitous apps and the, the the sex selective abortions and the you know the the, the infinitely subtler and therefore infinitely more acceptable ways um, that that terraforming can happen so you know do, do i do i think i mean it's it's eminently possible you know, i think there is already a subculture of people who, who are biohackers um who, who are doing their best to augment themselves you know do i think Neuralink will ever become a meaningful force i mean i was i was wrong about the i was wrong about ebooks you know those are those are a big thing now <laughs> maybe may, maybe Neuralink will be a big thing too but um if if it does take off there are going to be some interesting culture wars over it put it that way yeah, I think um, in many ways, you know, like you said, we're already there. Um, even if the if if the the fully technological version of this doesn't exist, you know, the you know uh, the abolition of man has already occurred, and and the replacement of of you know the, those instincts and those natural patterns of life are already kind of uh, warping us and shaping us in ways we don't understand, and uh, and will only magnify as things move forward. So. Uh, I think the the technological aspect is simply a furtherance of that. It's not a fundamental shift in the nature of it. Um, but let's see here. Uh, Jeffrey Fry, just a, a super sicker for 1999. Thank you very much, man. Really appreciate the support of the channel there. All right. So I think we made it through everything and I don't want to leave, uh, keep Mary forever here. So let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, I'm going to thank a bunch of people for supporting the channel, but Mary, can you tell everybody where to find your stuff and if there's anything that they should look forward to that you have on the rise? I know you just said you completed a book, so so definitely mention that, but uh, anything else they should be looking for? Yeah, on Twitter, I'm at Moving Circles. Um, on sub I'm, I'm on Substack as Reactionary Feminist. Um, the book will come out in the UK and on ebook in on the 1st of March next year. Um, the, the title is Feminism Against Progress, 
um, I, I don't know if I'm excited or completely terrified to see what the reaction is when it comes out, but um, I've, <laughs> I've, I've thrown a lot of bombs in a lot of directions and I'm, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting and fun. Um, yeah, so, so that's me. Thank you Perfect. so much for having me on. It's been great. No, absolutely. Really appreciate you coming on. I think it was a really great discussion and everybody make sure I've got her Substack and her Twitter linked below so you can get to those real easy. Make sure you check that out. I want to go ahead and thank uh, uh, Voluble Ox. I want to thank uh, Easter Worshipper. I want to go ahead and thank, let's see here, get through everybody. We've got uh, user F1F00C09. I uh, want to thank Santa. That's right. The big man supports this stream. We've got Jonathan Anomaly. Thank you very much for your support. Um, let's see. I think I got, oh, nope. I already got Easter Worshipper. All right, guys. I think that's everyone. If this is your first time here, of course, make sure to subscribe. Uh, you can also find all my stuff, Substack, Twitter, uh, you know, Gab accounts. If you want to get this on alternative platforms you can of course go to rumble and odyssey but i want to thank everyone again so much for uh joining us all the chat everybody very interesting and exciting questions here oh sorry one more uh super sticker here mm -hmm. from eleanor thank you very much i really appreciate it all right guys thanks again for coming by and as always we'll talk to you next time